respected uh, venerable sirs and uh, dear friends in the dhamma uh, i'm very glad uh, to spend this evening with you today and today uh, is a monday and this is uh, not today usually we have dhamma talks you know uh, not a regular day uh, but uh, brother leslie uh, want to utilize my <laughs> presence here very much so he managed to put <laughs> dhamma talks all days uh, i am here uh, but it happened to be the perfect day uh, to have a dhamma talk because today is a very special day for all of us uh, as some of you may know and today is the birthday of uh, our beloved teacher uh, most venerable bante punaji so he could have been uh, 7 89 today today so let us uh, dedicate this whole uh, dhamma talk uh, in memory of uh, our beloved teacher and uh, at the end of the dhamma talk we can uh, spend few time few minutes especially focusing on him and um, sending our uh, loving kindness and also sharing uh, the merits with him and today's topic uh, is uh, how to see the buddha <laughs> i think uh, throughout bante punnaji's uh, teaching uh, what he has he, with what uh, uh, he has been trying to teach us to to see the buddha <laughs> and he uh, tried uh, very much uh, to guide us to see who was the buddha and also to see the buddha within all of us uh, so we can really um, um engage uh, with his uh, uh, wisdom uh, in this topic and i was reading uh, some Uh, of his life story some of his very close friends wrote uh, in a book published in singhala uh, book and this very close friend this uh, actually is his classmate from very young age uh, shared in that article uh, when people ask from his classmates like which usually teachers ask from little ch- you know students uh who you'd like to be in future right so this friends uh, shared that during his t- their time in the school and when teachers asked students you know who you want to be and many would say that i want to be a doctor and i want to be uh, an engineer and so when it comes to bante punne ji and whose name was pushpa nand you know and uh, when he asked what do you want to be pushpa nand <laughs> to everybody surprise he used to say i want to be an enlightened person and buddha went down that's what he has said in you know, at that early age <laughs> when he was studying um, but <clears throat> but he could not become a monk because his parents uh, were from very um, uh, wealthy rich and aristocratic family uh they wanted him to you know <laughs> become a doctor <laughs> though he re- really very much wanted to become a monk at, at very early age he could not do that his parents didn't give him the permission and they wanted a uh, kind of honor to their family <laughs> uh so he pursued uh, his parents dream and continued his study and became a medical doctor and he waited until uh, his mother passed away <laughs> to become a monk and he spent that whole years studying and just to you know um, to mainly to to help and satisfy his mother's wish uh, and so uh, when this mother uh, passed away he realized that i fulfill my mother's wish and now she's no more here now i can follow my dream and that is then he became 
uh, a monk. So it's such a rare personality and such a rare teacher that I think uh, uh, as friends and devotees of um, Buddhist Mahavihara, <coughs> uh, you should be very happy that you know you are very fortunate uh, because I think you are the group of people who got the most out from Bhante Purnaji. <laughs> Uh, he has been teaching all over the world for many years and with his all experienced uh, says and uh, and he spent his last uh, 10 or little more years uh, in Buddhist Mahavihara uh, and uh, you are very fortunate to get the most benefit from him and on the other hand uh, it also his uh, uh, tenure here also was a very productive year for him also because all his teachings were put into a print form and then video form here. Yeah. And earlier there was only few publications uh, to his name and I think during his time here you all helped him and you all facilitated it and helped him to put all these teachings into books and CDs so they are, they are available now for anybody, any, any generation. So I think and you benefited from him and then uh, his I uh, stay here benefited uh, his di dissemination of the Dhamma too. So seeing the Buddha uh, is a very um, pleasing idea. How wonderful uh, if we can see the Buddha with our own eyes. We had to be really, really fortunate. We had to be really, really meritorious to see the Buddha. Actually, even to be born in, a, in, a, uh, in an era where the teachings of the Buddha is available, we had to be really fortunate. Because there are times, there are periods in the human history that uh, the teachings of the Buddha is not available. And there can be, you know, thousands of years that there is no Buddha appeared in the world. Um, and we all are very fortunate because we are living in a period uh, in which teachings of the Buddha is available. And not only that, uh, and we are also living in a context, an environment, where the teachings of the Buddha is being heard or is you know is discussed, you could you could have been in this particular period, but in the context and environment, there's no opportunity for you to learn and you know uh, listen to the teachings of the Buddha, uh, because it's very rare for for any being to evolve into such a level um, to to realize this deep truth. And uh, Bhante Purnaji always says that you know this is like becoming a superhuman, like super he called Superman. You know, that's his term, Superman in real sense, because in Pali we use the term Arya, Arya Puggala. You know, when you become you know mature in your spiritual path, when you become enlightened, you are called Arya Puggala. Usually we call noble person, but Arya can really mean uh, the noble and higher and evolve. What is happening in this process of enlightenment is actually something that is even going beyond the evolution. Uh, in the normal process of human evolution, and our mind is being conditioned, and also our brain is being conditioned, not to liberate us, uh, but to keep us bounded, <laughs> keep us, you know, uh, uh, stick uh, into this whole process. And in fact, recently, uh, and last a uh, few years ago, there was a, uh, a book came out um, called uh, "Why Buddhism Is True" uh, by an uh, author called Robert Wright. <laughs> Robert Wright, uh, uh, he wrote a, a book a few years ago called Moral Animal, and in that book, uh, uh, he, he, he's an evolutionary psychologist. And in that book, he's told that as an evolutionary psychologist, 
I have a bad news to tell you. Because through the process of evolution, we, he was studying the human mind, human brain, how it was you know, evolved through the you know, process of evolution. He said that in this process of evolution, our brain is wired to deceive us. And our brain is wired to keep us unsatisfied. And that is for the uh, purpose of keeping the species moving forward. And so our, the mind and the brain is wired to deceive us, not to let us know actual reality. <clears throat> and importantly, the brain is also wired to keep us unsatisfied all the time. Therefore, we keep pursuing, 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 and, and then in that process we will somehow pass our genes to the next generation. So the whole process of evolution making use of each and every individual being without really being kind to any individual being. So what is saying what is said that we are kind of in a trap and and so no matter how much you satisfy uh, you try to satisfy yourself, satisfy your senses and satisfy your sensual or sexual desires and this brain is wired in a particular way that you always stay unsatisfied, so you keep on doing things again and again and again and again. In that process, somehow the species, uh, the, your gene is transferred to the next generation, but it is not very kind to individual. Uh, and then after that, he was reading Buddhism and tried to understand what, you know, somehow he came across with the Buddhism, and then he was able to relate uh, to the teachings of the Buddha to his previous you know, understanding of the evolutionary process, he realized that what Buddha has said also through avijja, you know, ignorance and tanha, craving, because what he realized as an evolutionary psychologist that all beings, including human beings, uh, are in an ignorance. You know, they are, you know, their brain is wired to deceive them, no matter what false promises our brain is giving to us, we still don't get it. Our brain will say that, okay, you, you have your next joy, next pleasure, and you will be completely okay. Then we pursue that. And again, we feel unsatisfied. And the brain says, you get the next one, you will be okay. And we pursue the next pleasure. And we keep doing that every time our brain is giving us false promises, and every time we break the promise, but we don't get it. We keep pursuing it because it brain is also wired to deceive us, not to see these things. So when he learned Buddhism, what he realized that actually this is what the Buddha has also discovered, you know, many um, you know, thousands of years ago, that you know all beings are under ignorance and craving. And then what he discovered uh, in, through the learning the teachings of the Buddha is that Buddha has not only discovered the problem, because early book he said that we are all in problem. And it's a sad, you know, it's, it's a bad condition to be. You realize that you are in a problem or you don't know a solution, a way out. But when he learned the teachings of the Buddha, and he realized that Buddha not only discovered the problem, but also has given us a solution how to come out of this trap of evolution and how to go beyond this process of evolution and so he becomes so thrilled and he wrote the book called Why Buddhism is True um, so the Bhante Spunaji's idea of becoming a superman superhuman is, is actually has that deep meaning that this whole spiritual process that we are doing is something like going beyond the ordinary, normal, natural human evolution. This is like another step, like uh, re re reworking uh, the evolution process and you know, um, and creating a new. We can almost call it a new species, but you know, uh, really transcending you know all our limitations. Um, so, <clears throat> to see the Buddha. <laughs> as human beings, even to like listen to the, the teachings of the Buddha is very rare. Because this, in all this process, we have been trapped and we have been kept ignorant about this whole process happening within us. We simply react 
and behave the way our ancestors have been doing and ancestors have been passing these genes and there's no way that we turn back and see what is happening to us. So the appearance of a Buddha, the person who for the first time somehow got this, somehow found out, it's, it's, you know, it's like, like that you know, movie in the Matrix. <laughs> Everybody is trapped, and one person somehow was able to come out and realize that you know we are, yeah. you know, in this dream. Uh, so it's, it's very rare. It's a very rare. It's like coming out of the egg, breaking the egg, and you know, see this whole thing's happening. It's very rare. So we had to be very fortunate to be born in a period in, in that the teachings of the Buddha is available to us. So how fortunate. Should, uh, we should be to really to see the Buddha, to meet the Buddha, right? So today what we try to understand how we can actually see the Buddha. And um, during the, the time of the Buddha, there was a monk who actually became a monk just to see the Buddha. Miss literary see the Buddha, to gaze at the Buddha. Uh, as you know, the, the Buddha's appearance is so pleasing <clears throat> and so serene. Um, uh, his appearance, his physical appearance itself is very pleasing. Uh, and he has a special marks as a result of his long uh, practice long preparation to become the fully enlightened being, uh, his merits, uh, his uh, fortune was so great that uh, his, his body is quite special. And, and do you know how many special marks that the uh, Buddha had in his body? How many? 32 marks, you know, uh, 32 marks. And there are also minor 80 marks also. <laughs> Um, and sometimes when we create the statues of the Buddha, we try to incorporate a few of them. Uh, like the Buddha had a golden color skin, and a very shiny skin, for example. And his uh, hands are quite you know, long. It's very well built and quite long and almost touching his knees. And he had this special... Uh, the. Uh, hair coming right in the middle of his uh, forehead called urna urna rome when we when we some statues you know we can see that urna you know that uh, curly hair and he has very nice, uh, uh, very uh, wide and round uh, shoulders and there are such 32 special marks the buddha had um, and so even to look at his you know, physical appearance is, is pleasant. And by fascinated by his simply appearance, and one young boy, uh, one person, he was so fascinated with the appearance of the Buddha, he became a monk just to be around the Buddha. <laughs> Not necessarily to actually practice, yeah. Yes. No, he, he, he used to have, have them uh, even when he was a lay person, when he was Siddhartha. And remember when he was a young boy, uh, the ascetic Asita, the teacher of the uh, King Suddhodana came to pay a visit. And then he, he noticed the uh, wheel, mark of the wheel in his foot, foot friend, in his foot. The, uh, the wheel, mark of the wheel is another special mark. So he detected that and predicted that he will become the Buddha. So he had those, you know, special, you know, appearances. I think that is why, you know, um, I mean, he was definitely special um, from, from the birth too. So this monk, his name was Wakkali. And there's a sutta called Wakkali Sutta. And so Venerable Wakkali, now he has become a monk and and Buddha noticed that whenever he goes, that monk is around and he will be in some corner and simply looking at the Buddha. That is enough for him to simply have a look and have a pleasing appearance and just that is enough for him to be happy. 
So when after Buddha noticed that he is, you know, like going, like coming behind, you know, I, I think definitely he knew that he, is, he was not a spy. <laughs> Uh, but you know, and he was looking at the Buddha all the time and gazing at the Buddha. And one day, Buddha called him and asked, "You know, I noticed that you are around me all the time and follow with me wherever I go. What's the matter?" <laughs> because many of the monks will meet the Buddha and will get instructions, and they will go and will meditate and you know, practice, and when we teach others. But this monk was simply following the Buddha. When the Buddha questioned, and he actually admitted that Venerable Sir, I am actually fascinated by your appearance. Simply looking at you can calm my mind and make my mind pleased. So I am here just to look at you. <laughs> and, uh, but it's very interesting what Buddha told him. Buddha told him, Vakkali, no matter how long you will be uh, gazing at me, you are not going to see me at all. So, so even though you know you, we all want to like see the Buddha himself, but Buddha said to Vakkali, no matter how long you will be looking at me, you will not see me at all. And then he asked. What did you mean? Buddha said that if you really want to see me, you have to understand my teaching. Those who see the Dhamma, see me, see the Buddha. There's a famous quote, right? We quote it, uh, you can see it in many places. Those who see the Dhamma, see the Buddha. That is the Buddha's advice. So, luckily, there's no use from this physical feature, and this body is, you know, this is only a, a, a organism. You know, this is uh, this is a, a process, and this, although no matter how you know beautiful and pleasant it is, is is going to grow old. And in fact, Buddha's body grew old too. You know, if you read his last sermon, the last sutra. Buddha was simply looking at his own body <laughs> and telling Venerable Ananda, Ananda said, look at my body. This is like an old cart. But he was not worried about it. You know, he didn't identify himself with his body. So he was able to look at his body like objectively and see the reality of anybody. And he just said, that, you know, my body is like an old cart that has been, you know, managed barely. And he said that, now I have all kind of pains uh, in my body. The only moment I feel um, free of pain is when I achieve higher level of samadhi. This, is, this was the body of the Buddha towards the end. But fortunately he was able to, I mean, but he didn't, he didn't recognize himself with his body, so he didn't have the suffering, but physical pain was there. But whenever it's severe, he will sit down and go to deep level of meditation, which, which where he didn't feel his body anymore. So he said that in, in the last sermon. So he told Vakali, there's no point in looking at my body. If you really want to see me, you have to understand the teachings, what I'm telling. So, we really love to see the Buddha, but Buddha's advice is not to worry about actually seeing the physical appearance of the Buddha. And we can really see the Buddha when he put some effort to understand, uh, to, to have some glimpses of the teachings of the Buddha. And when people is, um, created the statues of the Buddha, and the statues of the Buddha was, were, were created much later, uh, at least like you know, 400, you know, 400 you know, later, uh, or 300 or 400 after the Buddha's passing away. So by the time the statues of the Buddha were, were made, nobody has seen the Buddha at that time. <laughs> Uh, so what they try to do, some try to incorporate the 32 marks, physical marks of the Buddha, but most artists were trying to symbolize the qualities of the Buddha, 
rather than recreate in the historical buddha yes. they were try to symbolize uh, the qualities of the enlightened mind so some statues therefore we have different gestures and different postures so some statues were made to symbolize the tranquility of the buddha the statue behind has the samadhi gesture and this statue is made to represent and symbolize symbolize the tranquility um, the stillness of the buddha and there are other gestures where you try to uh, represent the fearlessness of the buddha and then uh, wisdom of the buddha and his compassion of the buddha so <clears throat> so right now even even now when we see a statue of the buddha definitely and that that simply gaze at the statue itself can definitely calm our mind and this is very strange you know i think these artists have because many of the artists first produced the statue of the buddha they themselves meditated for a long long time and they themselves meditated and they somehow have some glimpses of what the you know buddha was teaching and then only they develop you know they build those statues uh, and of course nowadays not all artists are doing that but at least we follow that tradition they follow the the early uh, the features of those statues so even nowadays people who, people who are not necessarily buddhists whenever they see a statue of the buddha that can make a real a good Im- impact on them you know in in pittsburgh in our buddhist center we have a buddha statue inside uh, our the uh, shrine hall but we also have a statue of the buddha outside uh, uh, in a wooden you know uh, house and and some days we find people you know, who just you know come to our property and just come to the statue of the buddha simply look at the buddha statue and and they find it very pleasing um, and and we had the light uh, in focusing on the statue of the buddha we used to switch on that light so anybody who passing by you know our buddha, our buddhist center can see the statue and uh, for some days we forgot to switch that switch the lights on <laughs> and one day a person came to and came and the and uh, the doorbell rang and we we went out and he asked why didn't you why, why the buddha st- buddha statue is not here now and i told him that oh sorry we forgot to switch on this and the light he said i used whenever i used to travel in this road i used to look at that statue it is so pleasant to me so please switch your <laughs> switch on the light <laughs> so even this statue of the buddha can make such a you know impact even for people who are not necessarily buddhist because the um, the features try to represent the qualities of the buddha but the buddha's advice for us is no necessarily wait no necessarily to worry about actual seeing the physical appearance of the buddha but actually try to understand the deep teachings of the buddha and then what buddha is saying that when you see me through the dhamma you will have more joy and uh, in fact there's another sutta <coughs> uh we are the buddha described that how we can become we, we can be close to the buddha so i'm going to read a uh, quote directly from that sutta this is found in the buddhist text called itti uttaka and this, it is one of the texts you know found in kuddaka nikaya and in uh, in that uh, sutta buddha says that uh, even uh, a person who who will hold the robe of the buddha is so close he can hold the robe of the buddha and walk behind him behind the buddha even place in his his own steps in the marks of the footsteps of the buddha if somebody were to follow me like that it's not guaranteed that he's close to me <laughs> so let me read the the actual quote even if a monk taking hold of my outer robe the outer robe and were to follow right behind me placing his feet in my foot steps yet if he were to be greedy for sensual pleasures strong in his passions malevolent in mind corrupt in his resolves 
and his mindfulness muddled unalert unscented his mind scattered and his faculties uncontrolled then he would be far from me and i from him that is a stronger claim why is that because he does not see the dhamma not seeing the dhamma he does not see me so even if we were able to see the buddha even if we were able to be around the buddha according to the buddha we are not close to the buddha he is far from me and i from him and then buddha explained how exactly you can be close to the buddha and he said even if a monk were to live 100 leagues away do you know how long is a league i'm also not sure maybe about 6 miles 6 <laughs> miles <laughs> so even if a monk were to live right bande league you do not 6 about 6 miles yeah even if a monk actually the league the pali term is um, yojana actually that that original term came yojana uh, came to be used uh, the amount a uh, uh, a fox means a uh, amount an ox uh, can um uh, can 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 uh, work continuously without a break yeah yojanam yojanam uh, the amount the distance that a, a ox can travel continuously without a break it and so maybe 6 miles i don't know so however <laughs> even if a monk were to live 100 leagues away yet if he were to have no greed for sensual pleasures were not strong in his passions not manavel not malevolent in his in mind uncorrupt in his results his mindfulness established alert centered his mind at signless his faculties well restrained then he would be near to me and i to him why is that because he sees the dhamma seeing the dhamma he sees me so even though we can be very far away if we follow the teachings of the buddha and importantly if we uh, if our mindfulness is established and if our mind is settled and if our faculties means our eye ear nose tongue are restrained well restrained we are close to the buddha so here it explains in terms of space like how far i mean whether you live like 100 leagues away you can be still close to me if you follow these teachings and if you experiencing the benefits of the teachings i think that we can also y- use interpret this not only in terms of the space but even in terms of time like so we we are quite far from the buddha not in terms of the space but in terms of time we are f- far away from the buddha for like 2560 68 60 2560 61 Uh, 2560 is going to be 62 right yeah 205062 years away from the buddha but still we can be close to the buddha if our mindfulness is established if our mind can be settled if our sense um, sense faculties are well restrained and also there are other qualifications too but this is the lesson i think we have to remember if you really want to see the buddha and the way to see the buddha is not necessarily to worry about actually meeting the buddha and see the physical appearance of the buddha but actually try to understand the deep teachings of the buddha because it is the dhamma who made the buddha the buddha right it is the dhamma 
which made the Buddha the Buddha, you know, because the realization of Dhamma made the Buddha the Buddha. So when you truly <coughs> understand the teachings of the Buddha, and then we can we can really see the Buddha. Let's say we don't have, we didn't any practice any teachings of the Buddha, and we didn't, didn't have any experience uh, uh, that that the any experience that Buddha was talking about. We may not have any idea what Buddha has achieved, right? What the Buddha is trying to tell us. So even so, if we have a deep understanding, deep practice of the teachings of the Buddha, when we say the Buddha, you know, this is what Buddha is telling. When Buddha is meditating, we know this is what Buddha is experiencing. When Buddha is teaching, we know this is what Buddha is telling us. Otherwise, it can become a real simple uh, appearance. And there's another very interesting story that actually one person, even who saw the Buddha, didn't recognize the Buddha, but recognized the Buddha not through his physical appearance, uh, but listening to the teachings of the Buddha. Uh, but, but this meeting happened in the night. So maybe if he saw the Buddha in the, in the, in the day, this could have been different, a little different. But this shows that Buddha, Buddha was an ordinary, in, in ordinary human form. And this story is about a prince called Pukkusati. The name called Pukkusati. And there's also a sutta called Pukkusati Sutta. And this prince was actually uh, was from, uh, uh, from an area... The Buddha was used to live somewhat uh, eastern, northern India, and that's where the Buddha used to, you know, live. And like Savati, Rajagraha, and all the cities were in the the eastern part of the northern India. And there was a kingdom in the western part of the northern India, and like Takshila, <coughs> and city city called Takshila is from now. Nowadays, modern days is close to like Pakistan and Afghanistan. And so there was a prince <coughs> in that kingdom, and he used to be a very good friend with uh, King Bimbisara, who is the king of the Magadha, you know, where the Buddha lived. So they used to send messengers to each other and exchange gifts. So one day when this prince sent a set of gifts, like, you know, uh, he sent actually jewels, like gems, uh, to King Bimbisara, and King Bimbisara was a, uh, a disciple of the Buddha by then. He wanted to like give the best gift he can give. So instead of you know, sending him back some other valuable ornaments or something, what he did actually, he wrote some teachings of the Buddha in gold plate. And he inscribed few you know, important teachings of the Buddha in gold plate and sent him as a gift. When this prince received this gift, he was reading this and he really ringed for him. He, he was really fascinated with his deep teaching and he was reading and reading and reading and he realized that this teaching has deep truth and I am a prince and maybe I may get to become a king. Who knows, you know, there will be competition between other cousins, you know, other siblings. And even you know, when I become a king, you know, and it's not a simple thing to rule the country, and I always have to protect myself, you know, have the guards all, all around me. He decided that if I, this, this kind of deep teaching is available, no use of, you know, being, being a king and, you know, live a very stressful, you know, a life in fear. You know, most kings lived in fear <laughs> because, you know, I mean, they can be attacked and you know, whoever attacked can become the next king. <laughs> Right, so most, most you know uh, kings lived in fear. So he decided, I'm not going to become a king. I'm not going to remain as a prince, and I will go and find this teacher. And he himself renounced his life, his, his, his royal life, and then adorned like you know ascetic clothes, and he started to he started a journey, come from all the way from western, from Takshila, from western part of northern India, all the way, many many miles away. All the way. It took him months and months and months. So now he is reaching the eastern part. <clears throat> he is reaching the Savati. So that day, it became evening in the dark. So he was looking for a place to stay. 
there was a potter's house, you know, the uh, potter maker's house. And uh, he has a long, big hole. When the, the pots have been sold, that hole is a vacant hole. Many ascetics will come and rest. So when he was asked from the, uh, uh, the city, um, the people in the city where I can stay, they told, them, told him that there is a potter's house nearby. If Maybe you can stay your night there. So he went and Potter agreed and he allowed him to stay and he took residence in that place in that night. On that very evening, the Buddha was also happened to travel around that city. And in the evening, he also wanted a place to stay. So he also got the news that there's a Potter's house nearby. <laughs> Uh, like a motel, you know, <laughs> like hermit's motel. <laughs> and so <clears throat> he went to the potter and asked, you know, can I stay tonight here? The potter said, I have no objection, but the only issue is that there's another ascetic already, you know, staying there. If that ascetic has no problem, no objection, <laughs> you can stay with him. <laughs> so Buddha went to that hall and uh, and talked to this ascetic and told him, I want to spend this night. He said, well, oh, why not? You know, we have enough space. Please come. Let us spend the night together. <laughs> and so when the Buddha entered to the hall and he found a nice quiet place and he crossed his leg and erected his body and, you know, and was meditating. And after, when, after he came out from meditation, he saw that even the other ascetic was very quiet and he was also contemplating. And after Buddha observed his behavior, uh, the Buddha was quite, you know, uh, happy. Uh, he was pleased with his calm and disciplined behavior. Buddha decided to talk to him, and he asked, you know, uh, and for whom you renounce your life, and who is your teacher? What is the teaching that you follow? Pukkusati hasn't seen the Buddha. You know, he saw, he got the, you know, gift, the, the teachings of the Buddha. He read and, you know, he was so fascinated, he was so impressed. And he's coming to see the Buddha. <laughs> they have met already, but uh, the Bukkisati did not re recognize the Buddha. So when the Buddha asked, you know, who is the teacher you follow? And he said that, I am following, no, um, he said, my, I haven't seen my teacher, but I became, I became, I renounced my life to follow the teachings of a person called Gautama the Buddha. And I'm going to see him, and, and he is my teacher. <laughs> and <laughs> Buddha asked, that, have you ever seen him? He said, no, this is, that is why I'm going to see him. And he asked, will you recognize if you see the Buddha? He said, I haven't seen him, I have to see him, and if I see him, I may recognize him. And then he asked, who is your teacher? The, the, the Pukkisati asked. Who is your teacher and what kind of you know, teachings you follow? And the Buddha said, okay, let me explain you know, what is the teaching that I practice. And the Buddha gave a whole sutta. And that sutta is fortunately recorded for us. The sutta is called Dhatu Vibhanga Sutta. The, the, dis, the discourse on the analysis of elements. The analysis of elements, discourse on the analysis of elements. That sutta is hardcore Buddhist philosophy. And that is what Buddha said. And in, and in, in brief, actually, it's a really in, um, a very dense, a philosophically, you know, doctrinally dense sutra. But mainly Buddha is talking about um, basically six elements. <clears throat> the earth element... The water element, fire element, air element, and consciousness uh, as the five elements. And it's describing uh, as six elements, including the space. So earth, water, fire, air, and space, and consciousness. And Buddha is explaining this is ex what really, you know, what is re what really existing in the world, but then also not really existing in the real sense, but they interact with each other. And then also Buddha explains uh, this, that although these six elements are in function and working together, and that elements is also uh, 
become uh, meaningful when our sensory faculties are functioning. And then he explains our six senses, like five common senses, eye, ear, nose, tongue, and the mind, and say that our whole world is created by these six senses. Um, now I think, so he's explaining this, the, the whole world is none other than the experience of the six senses, and I think that is what uh, Bhante Purnaji also has been, you know, tr you know, trying to explain to us. Um, so that's the teaching Buddha gave uh, to this uh, Pukusati. When Pukusati was hearing this deep teaching, this deep teaching that the world is the six sensory organs and their respective experience, that is the world. And the six elements is the, the, the other components of this world. And when he was listening to this teaching, and he started to realize that this is the teaching that I heard. And this was the teacher that I was looking for. I, I was going to meet. At the end of the, the sermon, the Pukusati uh, bowed down in front of the Buddha and said, Venerable Sir, please forgive me. Now I realize that you are my teacher. And now I realize you are my teacher. Please forgive me for not recognizing you earlier and then pay respect. I'm so glad that I met you. Please ordain me as a monk. So Venerable Pukusati recognized the Buddha not through his physical appearance, but through his teaching. If Pukusati didn't know any of the Buddha's teaching, he will, not, he will never recognize the Buddha. Even he saw the Buddha in his own eyes. That's going to happen to us too. That's going to happen to us too. Even though we get a chance to see the Buddha with our own eyes, we will not care. Who knows whether, whether we were actually living at the time of the Buddha and didn't care. And there were so many people <laughs> didn't care what Buddha has to say. <laughs> right? And there were so many people, you know, even insulted the Buddha. And so we could have been so. So when Pukkusati was able to recognize the Buddha, because he knew the teachings of the Buddha, he knew the Dhamma, at least he has some glimpses of the Dhamma, not the full realization, but at least some glimpses of the Dhamma. Therefore he was able to relate to the Buddha, he was able to recognize the Buddha and see the Buddha. That is how we should see the Buddha. Even though we got the chance to see the, the physical, um, actual the presence of the Buddha, we will not recognize the Buddha if we do not start to practice the teachings of the Buddha and have some glimpses of the teachings of the Buddha. And this the extraordinary transformation that Buddha is encouraging us to create in our mind. If he hasn't started that path, if he hasn't have some understanding of that transformation, if he hasn't have some glimpses of that you know, unconditional reality that Buddha is uh, talking about, we may not see the Buddha. So, we all can see the Buddha through understanding the teachings of the Buddha. So, let us try to learn and understand and practice and have some experience of the Dhamma and we will definitely see the Buddha. And in future, if we happen to see the Buddha, we will definitely recognize the Buddha. We will definitely go in front of him. We will definitely, you know, listen to him. So I wish that may you all learn and understand and practice the Dhamma and we may, may we all see the Buddha. Thank you. We thank Bhante for the excellent Dharma sharing. Before we share merits with the Devas and our departed loved one, do you have any questions for Bhante? Yes, yes brother, please come forward. Yes. Good evening, Bhante.
brothers and sisters. Uh, Bante, just now you were talking about evolutions, uh, elements. Uh, how does Buddhism see the Charles Darwin theory on the origin of species, which is through the natural selections uh, from the studies of botany, uh, biology, and insecticide, is a cross pollination and that kind of mm. thing. They create a new species. Mm. And as, uh, as those are the fittest, right, will survive, mm. those that is the weakest, right, mm. will just leave the whole world. Mm. Uh, how is Buddhism view this evolution uh, from the point of uh, human life and uh, maybe spiritual uh, point of view? Thank you. Thank you, brother. I think actually that question is well answered. Uh, in the you know in the in the Bhante's, Bhante Punaji's um, writing and uh, even that simple booklet that you published recently um, on metta philosophy of metta you know there's a brief description and if you read you know his his books is clearly explained that so but I will give a very brief ex brief you know answer uh, Charles Darwin uh, saw the the natural selection as the driving force behind the process of evolution. Uh, Buddhist, what, what Buddhist explanation would be actually the driving force behind evolution is craving. Is craving. Craving is the one that actually shape our bodies and shape the species, the need, the need. When we have a strong need, we create those organs. Uh, and then when we have strong need, you know, we, we, we survive. Um, so I think there's no issue with the general theory of, you know, evolution in Buddhism, but Buddhism will add not only natural selection, but actually the mental factor, the craving, is the driving force behind evolution. So that's short answer, but I think, uh, I think, I mean, Bhante Puniji has clear answer, we can read that, yeah, thank you. Any more questions, brothers and sisters? <laughs> no question. Okay, yeah. Okay. yeah. Last question. When you are doing the time, you know that many of the things are not shit. Hmm. Yeah. Like yeah. So, is there any, any record of? Yes, yes, why not? So, I mean, in theory, the teachings of the Buddha is akalika, you know, if the, this technique works no matter when. Uh, huh? No, no time frame. It works. And there were many, many other like, enlightened disciples, the persons, even you know, after the Buddha. And even, I think, I believe that even in today's modern world, you know, there are uh, enlightened uh, masters. But they may not necessarily come out and broadcast themselves. So we have to find them. So, so there are a few monks that I truly believe that they have achieved, if not full, at least, you know, other the stages of you know, enlightenment. And we are very fortunate that they are around. And one monk passed away just, you know, the, the beginning of this year. And this year is a really, you know, uh, sad year for all of us. Um, uh, so, so there are, I mean, this, this, this technique works and it depends on how much dedication, you know, we can put into this. And definitely if we have more support, more, you know, um, the support is easier. But I think there's no time frame in theory. But if the Buddha is around, you know, um, if, we, if we have the some Buddha around, one special uh, uh, skill that only a Buddha would have, not an Arahant, a Buddha would have, is the ability to kind of scan and to understand what kind of defilements are strong in you and what kind of spiritual faculties are weak and always strong in you. So we call Asya um, Nusya Jnana. And he has a special ability to like closely watch 
and see what kind of uh, what is what is the dominant unwholesome tendency in you so he will give you an appropriate meditation to counter that extra thing in you uh, so that is why the buddha was able to like spot what is really what can work for you and then quickly you know like guide to make the process quick you know but even during the time of the buddha there were monks who took long time to achieve that so we don't have that, you know, <laughs> facility. But who knows, even though Buddha said that, okay, I think you have to work uh, th- with your anger and will we, will, we, uh, will we take the message seriously? <laughs> so we have to have some, you know, prior training for that. But so if the Buddha is around, definitely, uh, there are so many uh, like, uh, f- like facilities and the Buddha will be able to give us correct dose <laughs> to quickly, you know, to become enlightened. Yeah. But even in the absence of the Buddha, there can be other teachers who can help us. Yeah. Please come forward, my brother. Yes. Okay, this uh, regarding uh, birth and death. When a person die, right, I believe the spiritual consciousness will move on. Uh, the body will just leave behind. Uh, according to Buddhism, right, this spiritual con- uh, consciousness right, will go to take another life form, that kind of thing, right? Uh, my question is, is it immediate from the death, is the life form, or was that uh, basically a span, a timeline, kind of before they take another form? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, um, the proper way of proper way of telling would be like it is the craving that continues, and we can say that is a consciousness is 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 reestablished. But the consciousness, consciousness that is being uh, fed with the craving is the one that, like, you know, misrecognizes itself as an independent unit and then continue to, like, try to survive. Not really survive, but try to survive. So it's not simply, so we, when you say, say spiritual consciousness, so we, we, it can give a wrong understanding of a, of a kind of soul like entity that moving from one body to other. That is not the you know, teaching of the Buddha. Uh, it is uh, this attachment, you know, attachment and craving to this whole process can continue. Whatever, the, the, your question is actually whether this uh, transition from one life to the other life is immediate or whether there is an intermediate period, right? That, that's your question. Uh, that's a controversial, you know, issue. Uh, there are uh, different Buddhist schools provide different pers- perspective on this. But when you understand this whole mechanism, you know how rebirth occurs. Uh, the rebirth occurs because our craving has not been ended. Our craving for self identity is not. Is not ended. That is why, you know, like when at the moment of death, no matter how long you live, you are not ready. <laughs> you are not ready to like. You want to continue. You want to survive. You want to stay. You want to maintain your self identity. That's normal for all any being. The very meaning of sat satha in Pali, satha is the term for beings. The but the literal meaning of satha means attached. So anybody is satha, anybody is a being as long as that being is attached to its self-identity. So, so, so what really happens is that when, when our body collapses, our craving is not, it's still strong, can be stronger than you were born actually sometime. When our body collapses, our craving, our attachment to self-identity is not, it's very strong and that whole craving can propel the the consciousness to 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 exist in in a different way. So, because we, if if you understand that mechanism, what's really happening is that the, when the death moments occurs, the craving becomes so powerful and it can push the consciousness into excess in other form. So it should be immediate. 
if there's an intermediate period that presupposes a kind of entity that can exist by itself without the support of a physical or other base. Uh, so it should be immediate. But the issue is that uh, the human body is only one organism, but there are, can be many other refined, fine material organisms that can support life. Uh, so there can be many forms of life. Uh, the people are talking about immediate because they think that certain uh, realms, certain classes of beings have a short life. So they believe that you are born into like ghost and after a while you will born into another form. So the whole idea of immediate, I mean, uh, idea of like intermediate state uh, is come from uh, our attempt to impose our human perspective on these things. So if you talk about intermediate, you know, right now this present life is an inter intermediate life from previous life to the next life. So whether that life is long or short, it depends on the realm. For human realm, time is felt differently than the realm of the divine beings or the realm of the animal beings, right? For some species, you know, the whole lifetime will be, you know, very short. So the, the time is not an objective reality. Time is um, um, dependent on the classes of beings. So there can be, you know, life, forms of life that is shorter, uh, but that doesn't mean that they are ne they're necessarily they are intermediate. That's a full life. Uh, so, it, of course, that life can also die and continue to next birth, too. So, I think it's immediate. Yeah. Now, we would like to humbly invite Pante Pemaratana to lead us in sharing the merits accrued tonight with the Devas and our departed loved one. Pante. I think today, uh, first of all, this is the very good time for all of us to focus all of our mind and show our gratitude to uh, Bhante Purnaji. So we will uh, share the merits with him. I don't think that you know he he needs our merits <laughs> at all, <laughs> at all. But this is you know our way of you know our way of you know uh, our gratitude, our way of appreciating him. And uh, so I really miss uh, him uh, this time, you know, our conversation we had with him. I used to go to his uh, room uh, quite often and I have no idea, no, I have lost in the sense of time. <laughs> uh, when I come out, it has been too late sometime. Um, uh, so because it's so enjoyable to talk, uh, talk with him um, and... And uh, uh, he also uh, visited the Pittsburgh Buddhist Center, you know, my our temple, uh, a few times because he has one of the relatives living there. During his last visit, um, uh, he was looking for a robe, um, and so so I had because he also wear this same color of robe. So I had a new robe, you know, of this color. So I showed him. He said. Good for you, Bante. And he was so happy with the robe, and he took off the robe that he was wearing and gave it to me. <laughs> and who took, he took the new robe. And so, since then, you know, I, because that robe is also. Man, this is for the sharing. So, so, even that robe was a nice, nice robe, but for somehow he's, I, he thought that it's so, too silky, you know, I think that's why he went. So then I took that robe with such, you know, um, respect, and, uh, and now it's like a relic for me. Uh, because, you know, it's, it's, it's in his robe that he, he was wearing, and it is with me. So it's, it's a great thing. He was, he was such a friendly, warm um, uh, person, and and so we will, you know, particularly this time, I really, really miss, you know, his presence, his, you know, his, uh, his, his uh, jokes and everything. Um, so, so this is also a lesson uh, in life, right? How, so let us uh, be more <coughs> um, committed uh, to the practice, and that will be the best tribute we can make to the Bhante Purnaji. And right now, um, uh, we would like to uh, f let us focus our mind and share 
the merits uh, with Bhante Purnaji. So I think uh, you accrued merits by simply listening. You, you accrued a lot of merits uh, by staying and listening to the teachings of the Buddha and contemplating the teachings of the Buddha. During this period, your minds were free uh, from greed, hatred, and delusion. So whenever you keep your mind free from those we call poisons, you know, greed, hatred, and delusion, we generate so much goodness, so much merit, so much karma. And as a Dhamma speaker, I also generated uh, merit uh, as a speaker, uh, giving my time and my... Uh, uh, and then I would like to share my merits also with him. Uh, so what we are going to do, uh, we have this uh, pot, maybe the, all our monks will come to the pot and we will share the merits uh, physically there and you can join with chanting and with your mind. Okay? So... We will come here. Let us all focus our mind on Bhante Purnaji. Yeah. So we will invite him to rejoice this gathering and this merits and this uh, sharing. And uh, we will really wish him happy birthday in a really uh, a good realm. And hopefully he will come back and continue to teach us. If there is any living being in this world who would like to share this merit, may he or she do so. May all living beings, including devas and other beings, share this merit. May all beings be well, happy, and peaceful. Etnthavata chayammihi sambhatang punya sampadang sabbe deva anumodantu sabbe sampatanti siddhiya sabbe bhuta anumodantu sabbe sampatanti siddhiya Sabbe satta anumodantu Sabbe sangpatanti siddhiya Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu